Uh, we are continuing our discussion of Hume today uh, on the ideas of causation and necessary connections. Uh, so in chapter 5 of Hume's Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, well, in chapter 5 uh, we get an argument that you do not know cause and effect through either reason or through experience. Uh, now, what Hume is going to do in chapter 7 is he's going to give us an answer to the question, well, what are we really talking about when we talk about cause and effect? Uh, there is a certain important way in which Hume's theory of cause and effect is skeptical, uh, but Hume also doesn't leave us with nothing. He tries to give us a positive theory of what our cause and effect talk amounts to. And that's what we're going to find here in chapter 7. Uh, so here's the plan. I'm going to give you a fast recap of some of the high points of chapter 5 from the inquiry. Uh, and then we're going to move ahead to chapter 7. Uh, where's chapter 6, you might ask? Well, that's a brief chapter about probability uh, that is okay to skip over. Uh, so you can go back to the inquiry and look at it for yourself if you choose to, uh, but uh, it's you know, pretty standard when learning about Hume to skip from 5 to 7. But uh, after we review the chapter 5 argument, uh, we'll look at some answers to the question of what is power and what is necessity. Uh, and after that we'll finally get uh, Hume's ultimate definition of cause and effect. So, uh, here's where we got last time in chapter 5. Uh, Hume tells us that all knowledge is either matters of fact or relations of ideas. So, here's the quick idea. Uh, matters of fact are ways that the world really is. And you learn the way that the world really is uh, by using your senses, because for anything that you have to know via your senses, you can at least imagine that it might not be true. So, you know, I can see through my senses that it is clearly a beautiful, sunny, cool fall day today. Uh, but the fact that I am learning it through my senses at least admits that there's a real possibility that it could have been a you know, very wet, rainy day, right? So these are things that we uh, know through our senses, which conceivably could be otherwise. And in that way, we say like these things are not necessary truths, but they are contingent truths. Uh, and then uh, that is in contrast with relations of ideas. These are things that have to be true. Uh, they can't be imagined to be otherwise. Uh, and you can know them without using your senses. So we might say, look, uh, it has to be true. I cannot imagine it to be otherwise. And I know it even without my senses that triangles have three corners and that their internal angles add up to 180 degrees. Uh, so matters of fact, like that the sun is shining and it's a beautiful day, relations of ideas, uh, triangles are three-sided. Uh, Hume then moves on and points out, look, uh, cause and effect, right? So you might say like, look, isn't it a cause and effect that uh, a lit match dropped onto a puddle of gasoline in a well oxygenated room? Well, that's going to create a flame. Now you might ask, is that a conceptual truth? Or is that something uh, that is a matter of fact? You know it through your senses and it might be otherwise. And Hume says that a cause and effect relationship is a matter of fact. Uh, you seem to not be able to prove that, you know, a match dropped onto a puddle of gasoline will lead to a flame, even though you believe it. Uh, you believe it quite firmly. Uh, and Hume is also going to say, look, it's kind of peculiar to say that you know that cause and effect works through direct experience uh, because you only see one event followed by another event. 
you don't see what's tying those two events to others. So here's what Hume says, is that when you come to know cause and effect, it's through processes of custom and habit, right? Uh, it is through repetitions of uh, one thing and then another thing uh, that leads you uh, to draw certain kinds of inferences. Last point that Hume makes uh, is this view that is sometimes called doxastic involuntarism. So when it comes to the question of cause and effect, Hume says, you can't give me a logical proof that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. But he's also going to say, that's okay. Uh, where reason can't get you all the way there, uh, nature is going to fill in the gaps. Right? So in this way, Hume says, you have no choice of whether you believe in cause and effect. You just will. Uh, that is, uh, I couldn't pay you enough money uh, to believe uh, that gravity doesn't work. Right? Uh, you would not uh, run off the edge of a cliff uh, with no safety gear, uh, because no matter how uh, uncertain you are that uh, past events of falling will lead to future events of falling, uh, you're just going to believe that running out into the air unsupported is going to lead you to fall, right? So this is the way in which uh, doxastic, that just means belief-based, and involuntarism. You have no choice. It's not a voluntary choice whether you believe things. Uh, and in this way, it comes back to Hume's idea that custom and effect are custom and habit, excuse me, custom and habit lead to your belief in cause and effect, not reason and not direct experience. So this leaves us with a question, right? Where do we get our ideas of power, force, energy, and necessary connection? Well, Hume, you might recall in the second chapter of the Enquiry, he gives us what he thinks is a very powerful principle for understanding the world. And this is a principle that Hume calls the copy principle. Right? Copy principle says, you want to know what you're talking about? Uh, start with the experiences that your more complex ideas are built up from, right? So trace all your words back to ideas and trace all your ideas back to particular impressions of the senses. Now Locke told us uh, that we can get our idea of power by thinking about changes in the material world. So for instance, uh, let's see, yeah, I'll take my knit cap here, and when I let go of it, it falls, right? Uh, now, we might say that I get my idea of power, uh, that there's power in uh, you know, the atmosphere, or maybe my hat, uh, that's going to cause it to fall. It has a power in it when I let go of it, right? But Hume is going to say, look, you don't actually experience power in the same way that you experience extension and motion. So I'm exter experiencing the extension of my knit cap by seeing the space that it's taking up in my hands, right? And, you know, I can throw it back and forth and experience the, the motion in it. But when I think about the powers that it has, like the power to fall or the power to warm my ears, you know, we might think that well, that is not uh, something that you uh, experience directly, right? You experience the warming of your ears, but you don't experience the power to do that. So Hume is going to suggest that when we say that we experience the power of things or that we have an idea of the power of things, well, Hume is going to say it doesn't seem like we can trace that back to a particular experience. Um, and in that way, it seems we have a violation of the copy principle. Trace every idea back to a particular experience. Now, Hume also suggests that uh, maybe this is what's wrong with Locke's theory of substance. Right? Locke said, well, the substance is the something, the I know not what, 
which undergirds all the uh, experiences that I have, all the patterns that we notice in the world. Well, in this way, Hume is going to agree with Barclay, where Barclay told us, for instance, that, you know, we don't have to talk about this extra thing beyond our experiences of a thing, uh, because we don't even know what we're talking about. This is as abstract as an abstract idea. This thing, I know not what, what features of it can I assert? Pretty much none. Uh, but uh, it's the something there. That's how Locke is going to think about it. But Hume and Barclay are going to say, well, if you just call it the something, well, then you're not really talking about anything at all. Right. So this is sort of the, the puzzling place that Hume is left with, where he says, like, look, you don't see the tie between two events in the same way that you actually see the events. Now, uh, one argument that we will sometimes hear from Locke and defenders of Locke is that, well, maybe we sort of have an indirect experience of power when we're experiencing the power of, say, gravitation, or when we are experiencing the power of wool to warm my ears. Uh, that's indirect, but maybe we have direct experience of one kind of power, and that's uh, reflecting on the operation of our own minds, right? So here's an example. Uh, you can use your own mind to move your body. So I can say, I am going to move my arm up in three, two, one. And there we go, I raised my arm. And we might think that my power is in my mind, and my mind can raise my arm and then lower it again. Right? So Locke is going to think and asserts this, and you can go back to your book. Uh, Locke's theory uh, is going to say, look, uh, voluntary bodily motions as well as voluntary thoughts. Uh, it seems like you have a special power uh, to bring about certain events, and you are experiencing this power directly. Um, here's how Hume is going to respond. Hume is going to say, it's true that there might be some ability of the mind to move the body, or of the mind to take up certain thoughts, uh, but Hume still thinks that the relationship between the mind and the body is obscure. So he's going to say, why is it? Um, yeah, so I am, uh, you know, able to move my arm up, but when I look at the leaves on the tree over there, or when I look at my coffee cup on this outdoor table, well, I can't move leaves or coffee cups with my mind. The only way I can do so is by, you know, moving my body, grabbing the coffee cup, and bringing it into motion that way. So Hume is going to say, like, look, uh, you know, we might say, look, it's hard to explain why moving our body with our minds is possible, but telekinesis, that is moving material things outside our body, uh, with our mind solely is not possible. You know, here's how Hume's going to think about it. You cannot explain why you have control over some parts of your body, like your arm, right? But not other parts of your body. So he says, like, you don't have a voluntary control over your heart. So, like, my heart is making a rhythm. I suppose I have some control over the rhythm of my heart. So I could... Uh, for instance, uh, start exercising and raise my heart rate, or I could start meditating and breathing very slowly and, and intentionally and lower my heart rate. But I don't really have voluntary control over it like my hands. Uh, here's an example. I can use my hands uh, to make an interesting rhythm. I could do a rhythm like this. Right? But I couldn't uh, ask my heartbeat to make the same rhythm. Well, Hume is going to say, look, uh, the fact that 
uh, you're able to move your hands in a certain way, but not your heart in a certain way, without voluntary control. Well, that just is, right? And the reason why you can move the one part of your body and not the other part of your body at your voluntary control, he says, we don't really understand why, right? So he says, what's actually going on here is like the actual motions in my body, and to some extent, even the motions in my mind are made possible by unknown, or at least he's gonna say unthought of intermediary body parts and bodily events. So what's, you know, there is a complicated scientific explanation of what's going on when I decide to clap out a little rhythm with my hands and then put that into action, right? Now, what's going on there is probably, you know, I have some brain signals sent down my nerves, um, that can bring about certain twitches, there's certain uh, events of proprioception, so my body sort of knows what it's just done, and so on and so forth, right? But usually, when I clap my hands, I just think, I'm gonna clap my hands, and then I do it. But I'm not thinking about these intermediaries. Hume also notes that uh, when we go into paralysis, uh, suddenly, let's say, uh, it becomes much more apparent how mysterious it is to us why our body is or isn't working in a particular moment. So in this way, Hume is going to argue against uh, Locke and his idea that you can know uh, what power is directly by thinking about your ability to move your body voluntarily. Right? Uh, <laughs> Here's how Hume then puts it. He's going to say, look, is it more difficult to conceive that motion may arise from impulse than it may from volition? All we know is our profound ignorance in both cases. So what is he saying here? Well, he's going to say, we don't really know the explanation of why it is that we can use our minds uh, to raise our arms, right? Make the decision, I'm going to raise my arm, you raise the arm. Right. And we say, <laughs> it's very hard to understand or explain why we're capable of doing that. It is mysterious in a certain way. Uh, so that's that motion may arise from volition. Right. Now Hume says that it's even as kind of crazy that um, other motions can arise from impulse. So, you know, imagine these two fists are billiard balls and this one knocks into the other one, it transfers motion to it. Hume says, at some level we see this happening all the time, uh, but our understanding of what's going on in either of these cases uh, is actually quite fragmentary. So if we don't experience causes, what are they? Well, in a certain sense, Hume is going to say there's actually much less to causation than you might have thought. Uh, here's how Hume's going to think about it. He's going to say, look, when you observe cause and effect, what you're observing is one thing happening and then another thing happening. Uh, in this way, he's going to say, look, you are perceiving, uh, you know, the match being dropped onto the puddle of gasoline and then you're experiencing fire right so that's one event followed by another event that's what Hume is talking about when he talks about conjunctions or sometimes he'll even say constant conjunctions right but uh, you are not experiencing the scientific principles uh, the underlying explanations of what's going on underneath uh, that gives rise to flames when you drop a lit match onto a pile, into a puddle of gasoline, right? So Hume says the reason why we get so tripped up trying to think about the powers behind certain causes and effects, well, he's going to say you're looking in the wrong place for causes. Uh, 
So instead of saying it's this underlying secret power of an object, Hume is going to give us a couple of definitions of cause and effect. Uh, so if you go to section 29 of chapter 7, uh, or page 806 in our Shapiro and Lascano textbook, we're going to get uh, two, maybe three definitions of cause and effect. Uh, now here's the first theory. Hume is going to say, when I say that A causes B, what I'm saying is A comes before B, and A type events are followed by B type events. What this is really saying is that there is a regularity between these two kinds of things. They always go together. All right? So we might say, like, look, uh, flames being, uh, you know, in the room. Well, we might say that kind of event, uh, we can say that the cause of it is a match being dropped on a puddle of gasoline. Uh, and in this way, we say, like, look, uh, the cause comes before the effect, and things that are similar enough to the cause will lead to uh, effects of the same type. So what we're talking about when we talk about cause and effect on this theory is these things just go together. Now, uh, Hume says after this that in other words what he's saying, not only that this comes before that and they always go together, uh, is also if uh, the cause isn't there, then the effect won't emerge. Uh, so this is sometimes called a subjunctive theory of causation, right? So we say that uh, there's flames in the room, and that's because this match was dropped onto the puddle of gasoline. And we'd also say, like, look, if the match had not been dropped onto the puddle, then there would not be a fire, right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a subjunctive theory. If not for this, then the effect would not take place. Uh, now here's the third way that Hume thinks about it. He says also we can talk about cause and effect as A preceding B. So A comes first, the cause comes before the effect. And its appearance, or similar enough events, are going to lead us to expect or infer a B type event. So sometimes this is called the inference ticket approach to causal thinking. So we're going to say, look, uh, not only is there a relationship between the things, but we can also talk about our psychology of how we experience cause and effect. And we're going to say, look, uh, matches being dropped onto puddles of gasoline, like you're going to be running out of the room before that match even drops, quite possibly. Uh, because uh, your mind is totally tuned up by custom and habit to get from the cause to the effect. So let's apply this approach really quick. Uh, somebody might say, like, look, the baseball uh, is the reason why the window is broken, right? Those kids uh, playing stickball down the street, uh, well, they threw that baseball wide, um, it hit my front window and the window is broken. It caused the window to break. So following those three definitions of cause that I just gave you, regularity, the subjunctive relationship, and the inference ticket, we might say things like this. Well, uh, the baseballs hitting the window came before the break, and events like baseballs hitting windows are followed by window breaking type events. Two, now we can get a subjunctive theory of causation. So we say like, look, uh, the baseball caused the window to break. Part of what I'm saying there is, look, I'd still have an intact window if the kids hadn't thrown the ball. And third, we can talk about the inference ticket. When you see the baseball coming towards the window, uh, you know, it just leads us to expect windows to break. <laughs> you know, uh, if you were out there watching it happen, uh, you might even 
uh, as you see the ball arcing towards the window, you might already believe. You might already be uh, fearful and upset the way that uh, you know the effect is coming. Right? So this is how we think about causation for uh, Hume's constant conjunction theory of cause and effect. Now, there might be some puzzles and problems with this way about thinking of cause and effect. For instance, regularity theory, well, how can we explain one-off events, right? So if I said, for instance, that the assassination of Franz Ferdinand caused the start of the First World War, well, are we really saying that, well, we just see uh, First World Wars starting all the time every time you see a Franz Ferdinand assassinated? Well, no. Franz Ferdinand got assassinated once, and the First World War started once. Uh, so we might wonder about how we can make these claims about one-off events. This subjunctive theory, we might say, like, look, the baseball caused the window to break, uh, but uh, you know, we might say, look, uh, maybe after uh, the kid's baseball flew through the window and caused it to break, uh, then some other kids uh, sent a golf ball through the gap in the open window. Well, now it's actually not true that if the baseball hadn't hit the window, it would not have broken. Right? Because if the baseball kids hadn't broken the window, then the golf kids would have broken the window. Last one, inference ticket. Baseball's hitting the window precedes its breaking, and baseball's hitting windows leads us to expect windows to break. Well, the thing I'll point out here is that uh, many people have pointed out that causation isn't simply correlation. But oftentimes, people create correlations uh, where there isn't a correlation. Or there, people notice correlations where there isn't any causal relationship. Excuse me. Here's a simple example of a correlation that is not causation. Uh, you may have heard this one before. It's that uh, ice cream sales are correlated with the number of drownings in an area. Sort of a sad example. But uh, if you look at two charts, it's like when the ice cream sales are going up, the number of drowning deaths is going to go up at the same time. Right? Now the explanation is this. Uh, it's because it's summer. Right? So we might say that uh, even though we have correlations, we don't have causation. Now Hume might point out, your, your mind is not led uh, to the thought of drowning when you have the thought of ice cream, right? Nor vice versa. So there isn't a causal relationship between these two. But, you know, maybe summer and swimming and ice cream well, we might actually think that uh, these concepts are actually fitting together in a certain way. Uh, but we should notice that there are all sorts of uh, correlations in the world where people tend to infer one thing from the other thing. Uh, so I'll invite you to think about whether this raises an important philosophical problem for Hume. But for Hume, he's going to say, look, um, if we're going to be good empiricists, and if we're going to follow the copy principle, he's going to say, beyond, for instance, uh, you know, seeing two things go together, and super regularly, right? We might say that uh, in these cases, beyond this, beyond a regular connection between X and Y, um, we don't have any better theory of causation beyond this constant conjunction between X-type events and Y-type events. So, that'll end things, uh, but I will invite you to see how this gives us a couple of different ways of thinking about causation. You know, for Hume, this regularity, constant conjunction-based theory of causation says, look, 
we just mean that uh, there is this close connection between A and B. Now, here's one perspective on this. Some people might say, this is just good scientific thinking, right? So, if we want to say something scientific, we might try to go as deep as we can, right? So we might say something like, the Higgs boson particle uh, plays a fundamental role in the behavior of an electron. Uh, now, at some level, all we're going to be able to do is say, like, look, here's where we find the Higgs boson particles. Here's how we observe electron behavior. Um, and ultimately, uh, this is how we discover uh, the laws of nature and science. You know, you'll notice that, like, scientists aren't, like, out there trying to logically prove uh, that certain laws of nature hold. They are trying to propose laws that explain and unify our experience of the world. Uh, but science is going to proceed not by giving definitive proof of theories and principles, uh, but by having them left unfalsified. Right? And, you know, the way that we make scientific progress is by adding complexity uh, to our relationships between different things and different concepts. So people might have thought for a time that being a swan and being white was this deep underlying causal connection between the nature of swans and their color. Uh, but eventually they went to Australia and discovered black swans. And we might use these observations to realize that the laws of nature are more complicated than they are. But at the same time, we might also realize that all we can ever do is rule things out. And the best we can do for laws of nature is to figure out which kinds of events um, are observationally always tied to other kinds of events. Uh, so for some of you, you might find this Humean perspective on cause and effect and powers uh, to be edifying, or maybe a good way to simplify your thinking about what we're really talking about when we talk about powers and the laws of nature. Right? But some other philosophers hate this perspective. They think that Hume has made a terrible mistake here. Right? Uh, sometimes people say that uh, what Hume is doing is he's basically committing a logical fallacy uh, with this approach to causation. That it's a version of post hoc ergo propter hoc thinking. Uh, that's just fancy Latin. basically means after this, therefore because of this. Right? Uh, so... We might notice, like, two things always going together. Mm, there's something sketchy about making that a theory of causation, right? Because, for instance, if I were to say something like, look, every time the rooster crows, the sun rises, right? You hear the rooster, caw, caw, it crows, and then the sun goes up. That happens every morning. Well, it seems like on Hume's regularity theory, do we have to say that, like, that's some powerful rooster? That the rooster caused the sun to go up? Or here's another example. Uh, here's our friend Bob. Uh, Bob ends the night uh, with a drink. So he drinks a big serving of scotch and soda. Next morning wakes up with a hangover. He says, I don't like that. So the next morning he tries vodka and soda. And he gets a hangover. Maybe after that he tries tequila and soda. Keeps getting hangovers. And after enough of this, he says, I'm going to stop drinking soda. I'm going to drink my scotch or my vodka or my tequila uh, straight. Now, at this point, we might say, look, he's uh, making uh, a big logical mistake or he's just making a factual mistake if he tries to cut soda out of his diet uh, in order to avoid hangovers. Right. Now maybe here's what Hume would say back. It's like, look, uh, if you keep drinking scotch straight, you're probably going to get hangovers then too. 
and maybe at some point our friend Bob will realize that it's the alcohol uh, that's in the vodka, in the scotch, or in the tequila that's causing him to be hung over. Uh, but we might worry that there are all sorts of cases where we have uh, correlations between things, things always going together, um, and a psychological inference from one thing to the next thing uh, coming about. Well, uh, the critic of Hume would say that to apply Hume's theory correctly, we would have to say that there's causal relations between these spurious correlations. So, uh, I will invite you to think about whether Hume has given us a useful or perhaps a useless uh, theory of causation. So, that'll do it for today. Thanks for listening in, and as always, uh, be in touch if you have any questions uh, for me. Take care.